Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Keith Christensen, Chairman of European Paintings. I'd like to welcome you this afternoon for what I think is going to be a very exciting group of lectures. It seems to me hardly possible that the exhibition upstairs, the Renaissance Portraits from Donatello to Bellini, is drawing to its close. I suppose it's only natural that those of us who worked on it feel we created something special. It's the thought of every doting parent. But enough people have told me that they think so too that I'd like to believe that this is a generally shared response. Well, we wanted a lecture series no less special. The exhibition is composed of objects, but as the great scholar Abby Warburg noted long ago, these images of individuals have a special resonance and shed a special light on the period we know as the Renaissance. We wanted the lecture series to expand upon some of the issues related to the invention of the independent portrait. And so a few weeks ago, weeks ago we had a splendid lecture given by Lina Bolzoni, professor of Italian literature at the Scuola Normale Superiore in Pisa. For years, she's been interested in the relationship of portraits to poetry and literary descriptions. And her lecture, Poetry and Portraits, in the Renaissance, the crystal heart. If only I had a heart that was crystal clear, and I told her that's a very dangerous desire. Examine the amorous secrets that some portraits were intended to convey, employing some of the same devices as the poetry of the period, but also how certain literary descriptions can only be understood in terms of the practice of portraiture. Our lectures today have been made possible by the Italian Cultural Institute, and I want to note how frequently we have been indebted to them for these events. It's a wonderful collaboration. It's gone on for a number of years, and I hope it's one that we can count on continuing. Well, we're very lucky to have secured the two lecturers this afternoon. They will take us further into the world of the Renaissance individual. First on the docks is Professor Anthony Grafton, the Henry Putnam University professor at Princeton University. Professor Grafton is, quite simply, everyone's idea of what a Renaissance scholar ought to be. He is himself what used to be called a Renaissance man, and he reminds me of the subject of one of his books, that great polymath of the 15th century, Leon Battista Alberti. I don't know, Tony, where the elixir comes that enables you to produce what you have, but it should be patented, bottled, and sold, and I would be first online. I first heard Professor Grafton some years back at, the Columbia, at Columbia University. The topic was Alberti. The trek up to Columbia in the late afternoon was something I actually looked forward to, for this was a truly memorable series of lectures given with his amazing combination of erudition, insight, and informality. His other books have covered a remarkable, remarkably wide range of topics from Joseph Scaliger, a study of the histor history of classical scholarship, Cardano's Cosmos, the wor uh, worlds and works of a Renaissance astrologer, to what was history, the art of history in early modern Europe. And in chatting before uh, a, a little bit earlier today, I discovered that he has co-authored uh, a history of Western civilization, which we can all look forward to. His most recent book, published just last year, was written with Joanna Weinberg and is intriguingly titled, I Have Always Loved the Holy Tongue, Isaac Casaubon, The Jews and a Forgotten Chapter of Renaissance Scholarship, which seemed to me a, a subject perfectly suited to his interest in those dark corners of, his, of our field. He's a regular contributor to the New York Review of Books, as well as the Times Literary Supplement and the New Republic. Now, when Andrea Baer and I discussed who we thought would be our ideal Renaissance historian to address the topic of the individual in the Renaissance, our first thought was to contact Professor Grafton. And to my great surprise, despite his incredibly busy schedule and commitments, he accepted and even proposed the topic I had hoped, the art of biography in the Renaissance. Professor Grafton. Well, thank you, Keith, for that lovely introduction. It's a great pleasure and an enormous honor to stand here as the historical cuckoo in this grandest of art historical nests. Keith Christensen and Stefan Weppelmann have assembled a wonderful exhibition. 
They've displayed with consummate skill and wonderful, wonderfully weighed drama a stunning range of sculptures, paintings, medals, drawings, illuminated books. And their work has opened up for all of us one of 15th century Italy's magnificent obsessions. It's artists and patrons' passion for the portrait portraits of men and women, portraits of adults and children, evoked in all of their complexity and images in two and in three dimensions, portraits that could be rubbed between the hands, portraits admired on the walls, and of course there was a further range of portraits in frescoes and other media that even the Met couldn't transfer from Italy to here. My humble historian's task today is not to discuss the works of art themselves so much as to lay in part of the background that can help to explain why they were created. The passion for making portraits that inspired so many artists pervaded Italian society and culture in the 15th century. In writing as in painting, in Italian as in Latin, the effort to record for the world the experiences and sensibilities, the characters and emotional lives of individuals provoked creative acts of writing as multiple, as skillful, and as exuberantly varied as the arts of visual portraiture on display a floor above here. By looking briefly at the words of biographical and autobiographical writers from the 15th century, we will, I hope, understand even better what drove patrons to commission and artists to make that extraordinary range of works. The connection between portraits and words and portraits and other media is clear really from the very outset of the story that the exhibit tells. In the, mid, in the early 1430s, Leon Battista Alberti, scholar, mathematician, author a few years later of the first modern treatise on painting, modeled a brilliant, if slightly amateurish, the finish is not perfect, and he didn't really know how to tie that knot, a profile placket of his own head. The bastard son of an old Florentine family, he had to make his way despite lack of means, the resistance of powerful men at Florence and elsewhere, and the problem that he was a scholar, as he had said mournfully in his earliest work, of a thousand young men who start out as scholars, not a hundred earn their degrees, not ten write every anything, and not three survive to make an impression, odds which look even worse than the legendary scholarly job market of the moment. Yet when Alberti set out to portray himself, he characterized himself not as the retiring scholar of his little book on the fortunes and misfortunes of learned men, but as a hawk-like visionary, Roman in dress and Roman in profile. His hair perhaps slightly resembling the leonine hair of his friend and later patron, Leonello d'Este, eventually Marquess of Ferrara. Next to the uh, image of his face appear, of course, his, an, an abbreviated form of his name and his emblem, the winged eye, which he liked to accompany with his emblem from Virgil, quid tum. What, says Virgil, what if a mintas is Tory? quid tum, you wanna make something of it? Here, Alberti emphasizes the soaring power of the eye, the eye which he claimed to be the most powerful of war organs, the eye which could take even a poor man like Alberti to triumph in the world. So he's describing himself here in the most powerful and novel of ways as a sovereign artist, one might say, and someone of intelligence, virtue, and talent who's made his own standing in the world by the skill of his hands and the conceptions of his mind. Like so many of the portraits on display, it's both an extraordinary inquiry into the person as he is and an idealized vision. It sends a message about the person that he wanted to be. Alberti matters for the story of, of portraits. He knew and worked with both Matteo de Pasti and Pisanello, whose work you see here, masters of the profile portrait and metal form. It's one of the genres in which the portrait really spreads from Florence into the courts of Ferrara, Mantua, and Urbino, where those artists worked. Like those two men, he was a prolific and expert portraitist. He drew and modeled the faces of his friends while they talked to him and threw away any portrait that a child couldn't recognize the original of. Sadly, they all seem to have been thrown away. We have only one or two pieces of work by him. 
He told readers of his treatise on the art of painting that paintings that had a portrait in them worked differently from those that did not, had a different power on onlookers, and he asked artists at the end of that book if they appreciated it to put his face into their work. I think it's very clear that he, both his example and his encouragement played a role in the new fashion for portraits of individuals as it spread into the courts where, of which he was a habitué. Unlike de Pasti and Pisanello, however, Alberti didn't confine his efforts at portraiture to visual media. He also wrote in the 1430s an autobiography, a pre precocious one given that he was only a little more than 30 years old. It's modestly couched like the works of Julius Caesar in the third person. And it's as vivid and brazen in its own way as the portrait plaquette. Alberti, Alberti tells us, was a brilliant athlete. He could jump over the head of a man standing next to him from a standing start. He could throw a coin so high that it rang as it hit the ceiling of the Florentine Duomo. <laughs> Wounded in the foot as a teenager, he not only bore the doctor's painful sewing up of his wound without crying out, but held the edges of the wound together, singing to track, distract himself. He loved to look at handsome old men, but mourned depressed when he went out into the fertile fields and saw their fruits. Most remarkably of all, he made a special practice of handling and looking at the things he loathed, such as honey and garlic, until he no longer shrank from them. And he thus, the book says, offered an example to show that men can make anything of themselves if they wish. It's an extraordinary claim, all the more extraordinary because elsewhere in the biography, Alberti tells of the depression and delusions that had almost paralyzed him in his years as a student. Alberti made clear in the life, in a way exactly as he had made clear in the plaquette, that he saw art as the key to making one's way in society. Not only the visual arts, however. Above all, he said one must apply the greatest artistry in three things, walking in the city, riding a horse, and speaking. And a further art must be added to the other three. Namely, none of these must be seen to be done in an artful way. Only by maintaining a constant grace of posture and an air of total effortlessness could a man like Alberti win the universal approval that he sought. Now, if these stories are familiar to you, there's a very good reason why. Jakob Burkhardt, the great Swiss cultural historian who created the modern understanding of the civilization of the Italian Renaissance, as his great book of 1860 was entitled, retells every one of these stories in his description of the universal man of the Renaissance, which lights up the second book of his great cultural history. In fact, as the catalog of this wonderful show makes clear, a wonderful article by Patricia Rubin, Burkhardt, though a great expert on Renaissance art, knew few portraits from the period, even though he saw individualism, the desire to develop one's personality and make an impression and have that last forever as the key to Renaissance culture. It was actually from Alberti's literary portrait and other biographies that he derived the ideas which still shape our vision of the Renaissance and which, when Boda and others brought the portraits together turned out to apply to them with extraordinary prophetic force. When Alberti modeled his profile in metal, he made creative use of classical models, gems, and Roman coins, which had been studied by antiquaries here, a 14th century antiquary, Giovanni de Matocci of Verona, uses them to illustrate his history of the Roman Empire for more than a century. And he did something very similar when he wrote his own life, adapting an ancient model to his own modern and individual requirements. In, the, in some time in the history of the Roman Empire, we don't really know exactly when, a strange Greek writer named Diogenes Laertius compiled the lives of the Greek philosophers from Thales and Solon, the legendary predecessors of Socrates back in the sixth century BCE, down to the Stoics and Epicureans. Traditional positive, positivist scholars used to mock Diogenes, and it's true that he gives us a lot of anecdotes to a relatively small amount of philosophy philosophy. It's to Diogenes we owe our knowledge that Thales going out to observe the stars fell into a well and was mocked by the serving maid who always turns up in such stories, and that Zeno liked to eat green figs. 
But Renaissance scholars found his work really exciting, as you can see from the marginalia that this reader entered in a copy of the first printed edition. He gave them a model for writing the biography of a thinker rather than a doer, someone whose distinction lay in the way he'd existed as the head of a school and a teacher rather than a captain. And they quarried from it rich information, such as the three letters of Epicurus, which are still the only ones we have and about which you can read in Stephen Greenblatt's wonderful book, The Swerve. Now, the book was translated into Latin in the 1430s by a friend of Alberti's, the Camaldolensian monk Ambrogio Traversari. Alberti read it in Traversari's translation. He was probably one of the very first to read it. And within a few years, he'd adapted it into his portrait of his own self. And it's just marvelous to see him at work, to see him take Diogenes's method of drawing a character anecdote by anecdote, trait by trait, and applying it to himself. Alberti portrays himself in his autobiography as a master of wit and repartee, rather like Oscar Wilde. Unfortunately, rather like Oscar Wilde, he didn't invent all of his jokes. So at one point, he answers riddles. Asked what would be the biggest of all things among mortals, he answered, hope. As to the smallest, he said, the difference between a man and a corpse. It's a good answer, but he'd read it in his Diogenes Laertius, who tells us that Thales said there was no difference between life and death. Why then, said someone to him, don't you die? Because he said, it makes no difference. <laughs> Here you see how classical materials recombined creatively could make a portrait. And as you think about the paintings and above all perhaps the sculptures in the exhibition, it would be well to think about the ways in which they too take earlier, especially classical images and ways of, portrait, of drawing portraits and reapply them in a creative manner. This is one of the ways in which reading the, print, the written biographies can help us, I think, to see the portraits more deeply. Neither Alberti's passion for immortalizing his self nor his method of creative adaptation were unusual. Both had flourished for a long time, especially in Florence, the city to which he returned in the 1430s to find it in the white-hot middle of an artistic revolution, as he explained in his book on painting. Florentines were extraordinarily literate. It was a mercantile city. Every head of a substantial Florentine household was also the head of a firm with investments to keep track of and partners to watch and bigger investors to watch out for and Ponzi schemes to look out for. And they reacted by using their extraordinary writing skills. It's just amazing. In 1427, when the Florentines instituted a new tax system, the Catasto, that required every Florentine to write a tax return, 40,000 Florentines out of a population of under 100,000 were able to write their returns. It's an extraordinarily literate society. And dozens of merchants kept not just ledgers, but books that modulated from ledgers of business affairs into autobiographies, sometimes giving us charming little bits of information. Here's the physician Giovanni Cellini from San Miniato recording a special gift. I record that on the 27th of August, 1456, when I was treating Donatello, that singular and leading master of making statues of bronze and wood and terracotta, in his kindness and for my effective treatment of his illness, he gave me a tondo the size of a plate, which you can see. But the Ricordanza are at their richest when they reveal, like so many of the portraits on show here, the multiple facets of a single personality. In Florence, as elsewhere in Italy, what mattered most to the heads of households was maintaining the position of their families in the economy and society. But in mercantile Florence, creative destruction ruled. Family positions were always vulnerable. A century before Alberti, royal bankruptcies had destroyed the greatest banks, the Bardi and the Peruzzi. The head of a Florentine family knew that he sailed stormy seas, as Giovanni Rucciolai, eventually Alberti's patron, knew when he chose the sail, filled in this case by the wind of fortune, as the emblem that scuds across the facade of the palace that Alberti designed designed for him in Florence. These men lived in vulnerable positions, always in danger of losing a competitive advantage, of having an investment in a mercantile voyage blow up. 
We're still ambitious players in a commercial society who fought for gain with every licit weapon. They were also pious believers in traditional Catholic truths who listened with passionate attention to Bernardino da Siena, whose portrait you see in the galleries above you, giving his fiery speeches, denouncing taking money, lending money at interest, and the other pr uh, practices of commercial society. They strove for gain and for salvation, and they felt a strain, a deep strain, in pursuing these divergent goals, one that often made them feel as if they had divided souls. In their wonderfully frank mixtures of plans for self-improvement and confessions of irredeemable human weakness, the Ricordanza offer some of the richest portraits of personality in the Renaissance. Here, for example, is Goro Dati, merchant, writer, a man who knew the coast of North Africa, which he portrays here in his work on the sphere at first hand and could tell you exchange rates around the Mediterranean world, reflecting on his midnight midlife crisis. I know that in this wretched life our sins expose us to many tribulations of soul and passions of the body. I see that since my birth 40 years ago I have given little heed to God's commandments, distrusting my own power to reform, but hoping to advance by degrees along the path of virtue. I resolve from this day forward to refrain from going to the shop or conducting business on solemn church holidays, or from permitting others to work for me or seek temporal gains on such days. Whenever I make exceptions in cases of extreme necessity, I promise on the following day to distribute alms of, gold, of one gold florin to God's poor, and I'll go to the gym. I have written this down so that I may remember my promise and be ashamed if I should chance to break it. In this vivid personality caught between passions, each of which he felt as deeply as the other, you see very much the sort of person whose deeply cut faces you see in the galleries above us. Since the 14th century, moreover, literary portraiture and self-portraiture had been high forms of art in Florence. The creators of Italian humanism, Petrarch and Boccaccio, produced biographies by the dozen. Petrarch compiled a magnificent marmoreal biographical compendium on illustrious men, which went through more than one version and gave him many different chances to express his opinion of the great. Scipio Africanus gets 178 pages, Romulus only two. That really gives you a sense of how he thought of them. Boccaccio produced a less marmoreal but more amusing compendium on illustrious women, which begins with Eve and includes many accomplished women. There, Tamaris the painter who scorned womanly tasks at the top left, and Circe the enchantress who put a new spin on them on the bottom right. Coming down to his own time, he described the dangerous Queen Joanna of Naples, Sicily, and Jerusalem, sketching her complex character with deftness and economy. Joanna is so astute, he says, that only trickery, not brains, can deceive her. She's generous in the manner of a king. She is soft-spoken, and her eloquence, eloquence pleases everyone. When the occasion demands it, she has a regal and unyielding majesty. Equally, she can be affable, compassionate, gentle, and kind, so that one would describe her as her people's ally rather than their queen. The humanist's contribution to the art of literary self-portraiture and portraiture went far beyond the writing of formal biographies. Petrarch showed extraordinary ingenuity, as well as a lifelong commitment to the confessional mode that has made him seem to me as I teach to be something like a model for the modern Californian, discovering one unlikely opportunity after another to portray his own character. He wrote a letter to posterity. Greetings, he says, imitating the poet Ovid. It's possible that some word of me may have come to you, though even this is doubtful. And goes on to describe not only his writings, but his complexion, his dark, lively eyes, his passion for the ancient world, and the fact that he'd had to start using glasses when he turned 60 years old, becoming the first intellectual we know of to lengthen his working life in that way. Adapting St. Augustine's Confessions, he wrote and rewrote a wonderful letter to his friend Dionigi de Borgo San Sepulcro on his ascent of Mount Ventoux in Provence. Augustine in his Confessions had told the story of how he struggled endlessly to make himself a Christian, and finally hearing a child's voice say, tolle lege, tolle lege, take and read, had read the passage that enabled him to make the final commitment. 
Petrarch turned his difficult climb of the mountain. It's not so difficult now. Every year, students send me back the rocks they buy in the shop at the top. And, and they, Petrarch made his account of the difficult climb into an allegory of his own lifelong search for virtue, telling us how he had struggled to reach the top, to see the view, how sitting there he opened his little pocket copy of Augustine's Confessions, the very book that was his model and which is still in the Bibliothèque Nationale, and read there that he shouldn't have been up the mountain at all, that he shouldn't be seeking fame as a writer, that he should be searching within himself for moral truths, and then went down the mountain, wrote, wrote the letter, rewrote it eventually, and said, um, the time during which the servants have been occupied in preparing our supper, I've spent in a secluded part of the house, hurriedly jotting down these experiences on the spur of the moment, complete lie, lest in case my task were postponed, my mood should change and my interest in writing flag where Augustine had told the story of his absolute conversion to the unquestioned life of the Christian, Petrarch portrayed his self just as unforgettably as one who could never make that final step, though born, of course, in a Christian world. Petrarch's ingenuity was enormous. He used colophons in some of the manuscripts that he wrote, this of his Bucolicum Carmen, to set the dates when he'd written them and explain in this case that he'd written this manuscript himself. He even made some of the books he owned, here his magnificent copy of Virgil, now in Milan, into notes on his progress through life. Here he writes of his beloved Laura, illustrious in herself and long celebrated in my verse, first dawned on my eyes while I was yet a youth at the church of St. Clara in Avignon in the year 1327 on the 6th of April at daybreak. And in that same city on that same month of April and that same morning hour of the year 1348 was that fairer light withdrawn from the light of day. For Petrarch, in other words, everything from a manuscript of his own writing to a book in his library could be part of a cumulative and enormously rich venture into self-portraiture. Alberti was very much Petrarch's heir when he used the multiple means that he did to immortalize himself. So by the 15th century, members of the Florentine elite, those very people who, paid, who supported the great new vogue for portraits in the 1420s and 30s, were already dedicated to preserving the memories of their experiences and their feelings, remaking themselves in words as they hoped to remake themselves in their sons, and you can see that upstairs as well. Florentine scholars inherited the tools that Boccaccio and Petrarch had forged and multiple ancient models for writing biographies. Suetonius's wonderful gossipy lives of the Roman emperors who tells us that Augustus used to say, quick as boiled asparagus. <laughs> Plutarch's lives of the Greeks and Romans with their model of well-weighed comparison between great men of different origins and contexts, and saints' lives, which, as Alison Fraser has shown in a wonderful book, Possible Lives, were probably the most popular biographies of all in the 15th and 16th centuries, and which inspire a good many of the more pious portraits that you can see above. And you can see the creative impact of these models, for example, in Leonardo Bruni, longtime chancellor of Florence, rewarded with this magnificent monument, and Santa Croce, pretty good for a literary man, um, writer of Florentine history and Florentine official propaganda, and author of multiple biographies of great creativity, a biography of Cicero, which for the first time treated Cicero strictly in pragmatic terms, not worrying about the morality of his political life in the late Republic, but just weighing it for its successes and failures. The most remarkable of his achievements, I think, is his Plutarchan life, lives of Petrarch and Dante, where he takes the two great Florentine writers of the 14th century, Dante, the politically engaged man whose masterpiece had been an Italian, Petrarch, the retired scholar who had mastered the Latin classics as Bruni himself had, weighs their accomplishments against one another in a complex dialectical way, praising Dante for his political engagement, but noting that it had ended in disaster, 
wishing that Petrarch had been somewhat more engaged, but also seeing the virtue in his ability to pursue his scholarship to the end by avoiding political engagement. It's an extraordinary exercise in biographical writing, and at one point moves into a brilliant argument on the cultural value of the Italian language itself, making the argument, even though he supports Petrarch really over Dante, that Italian, Dante's language, was as capable of great accomplishment as this Latin that Petrarch had preferred to write in. So in this rather small and articulate community, fewer than 100,000 people, mostly concentrated on the side of the Arno, around the Duomo and the other sites of great cultural accomplishment, the fashion for literary portrait painting spread well beyond the confines of the political and social elite. Alberti was by no means the only person who combined uh, artistic por portraiture and self-portraiture with literary. Lorenzo Ghiberti, for example, sculptor of the two great sets of bronze doors on the baptistry and uh, famous for his own self-portraits, which he left there, also drew his portrait in writing. In his commentaries, which begin as a technical work uh, uh, responding to ancient authors like Pliny and Vitruvius on the history of art, mutates briefly but brilliantly into an artistic self-portrait in which he explains at length how he had solved terrifyingly difficult problems of perspective and foreshortening, especially as he made his second set of bronze doors. It's a short but wonderful piece of writing, and between the braying notes of self-praise that make Ghiberti so irritating are wonderful moments, such as the one in which he explains that he had been the only connoisseur to see the virtue of a particular ancient sculptor because he hadn't merely looked at it, he'd felt it with his hands. Don't we wish we could do that to the sculptors upstairs? It would be the best way to see them. His great rival, Brunelleschi, with whom he fought it out, not just to do the bronze doors, but also to build the dome over the Duomo, was also a great, uh, a great object of portraits, though in this case made by someone else. This is the, from the Brancacci Chapel, traditionally identified as a portrait of Brunelleschi by Masaccio. But the great portraitist of Brunelleschi was Antonio Manetti, mathematician and scholar, who in a wonderful Italian life portrays Brunelleschi as something like the first bohemian artist. He and Donatello as young men go to Rome. They work only when they have to to support themselves and spend all their time digging in the Roman ruins, drawing Roman facades. The Romans, totally baffled by this conduct, thought they think, think of them as treasure hunters and call them that. Minetti traces Brunelleschi's development from the brilliant, irresponsible young artist of the Roman years to the extraordinary inventor who was able to build the dome with machines, the models for which he cut out of vegetables and gave to his craftsmen so that they would rot before his rivals could take advantage of them <laughs> and imitate him. The winner of the first patent for an invention the brilliant engineer who brought time and motion into the overseeing of work for the first time, making the sellers of wine and bread climb the scaffold to serve his workers rather than allowing his workers to descend as the workers traditionally had in order to get their lunch. Here in Manetti's work, you see the details, not just of artistic practice, but of construction as a trade becoming a fit subject for biographical work. Ghiberti and Brunelleschi were grandees, to be sure, but still, this is a world in which artists are now the subjects for biography. In other words, self, the, the passion for self-portraiture and portraiture crossed social and cultural boundaries. In the 16th century, when Giorgio Vasari and Benvenuto Cellini wrote the magnificent lives of the artists in Vasari's case and the greatest of all uh, Renaissance autobiographies, Cellini's Vita, they were carrying on the traditions that had, been that had really taken shape in the Florence of the 15th century, following trails that Ghiberti and Manetti and others had broken then. Across Italy, the Florentine portrait bug proved infectious. States were passing into the hands of men like Federigo da Montefeltro, tough men. 
the Visconti and Sforza of Milan, the Estensi of Ferrara, men who came from problematic backgrounds, sometimes of illegitimate birth, men whose power as rulers rested on their abilities to work without conceding power to those who assisted them, to fight their way out of impossible situations, to be on guard at all times against internal assassins and outside enemies. In 1478, a clan with the wonderful name of Pazzi, the crazies, tried to kill Lorenzo and Giuliano de' Medici in church. We now know that their learned friend, that passionate consumer of culture whose portrait by Piero di Spagna is also upstairs, Federigo de Montefeltro, was waiting outside Florence with a mercenary army ready to come in and help the Pazzi. However, they, fa they killed Giuliano, but failed to kill Lorenzo, and Federigo stayed outside while the Pazzi's heads were turned into footballs by loyal Florentine boys. Rulers of this kind sat on thrones that trembled on the tops of potential volcanoes. They saw cultural patronage as a way to shore up their power. They sought the solace that came from brilliant portraits in words as well as in paint, and found gifted writers eager to provide exactly the service they needed. The great Roman scholar, Lorenzo Valla, for example, had as his favorite patron Alfonso of Aragon, a soldierly man of classical tastes, the ruler of Naples, who cured himself of illness by reading the Roman historian of Alexander the Great, Quintus Curtius, and staged what he called hours of the book, at which he would set two humanists to correcting the same passages in Livy and wait until one of them had beaten the other into submission. This was just the patron for a bold writer like Valla, who received a commission to write the deeds of Alfonso's father, Ferdinand. He wrote a magnificent life, one that defies the marmorial decorum expected of lives of great men. Federigo Yo Ferdinand yawns in public, he falls asleep, he refuses to behave like a plaster ruler, he behaves like a human being. And at one point, Valla even turns the life into an inquiry on how you write Latin about a world in which ships are steered by compasses, the battlefield is dominated by cannon, and time is regulated in cities and monasteries alike by clocks, questions that would, have bede that would bedevil people who wanted to write classical Latin for centuries to come. So biography could become a wider field of cultural inquiry. In papal Rome, the empty city with its 20,000 inhabitants at the early, in the early part of the 15th century, a city built for a million, was a particularly fertile field for portraitists. The popes and cardinals, most of them from great Italian and Spanish families who began to fill the eerily deserted spaces of the eternal city with their enormous palaces, were delighted to pay for busts and portraits of themselves. And where the artists came and found commissions, hungry humans weren't far behind. The pioneer Hebrew scholar and diplomat Genozzo Manetti wrote a brilliantly evocative life of this powerful Pope Nicholas V. Without Manetti, we wouldn't know in any detail that Nicholas planned more than a century before Sixtus V to move the great obelisk that stood by the side of the old Basilica of St. Peter's, bring it to a more prominent position, and set it on staff four bronze colossal statues of the evangelists, while at its top, an other grand statue of Christ in bronze would hold up a gold, sta a gold cross an incredible architectural and sculptural program designed, so Nicholas explained, to restore the authority of the church, which its Babylonian activity had called into question. So biography could expand into the study of urbanistics and other cultural programs. And even Minetti couldn't rival the most skillful observer of papal conduct, the pope himself, Pius II, born Aeneas Silvius Piccolomini of Siena. He entertained all of Europe, safely dead, with his extraordinary autobiographical commentaries in which he traced his wanderings from the elegant young man you see here at the court of Scotland until his grave days at the, as pope, telling us how he saved his virginity from the attack of two eager Scottish women who spent the night with him, how he refused the, the, the temptation to enter what seemed to be a dangerous ship voyage and then watched it with, uh, with complacency as it went down, to how, as a middle-aged man, he put down a revolt of cardinals in the men's room at the Vatican and ensured his own election to the papacy. 
It's Pius who writes more brilliantly than anyone else on urbanistics as he describes his own wonderful, tiny, ideal city of Pienza, the stage set into which he transformed his native little town of Corsignano outside Siena with a marvelous passage which, in which he talks about the beauty of the buildings, admits that the cathedral had developed a huge crack as soon as it was opened. The crack is still there, and you can sit there and read this passage standing by it, which is always good to make yourself nervous. And then, as a kind of wonderful final flourish, describes the young boys in the village racing naked in the mud as he and the cardinals look out from the windows of the papal palace. A wonderful set piece, the finest evocation we have of that edifice complex that dominated the wealthy and powerful of Renaissance Italy so much and made them build these extraordinary palaces. My own favorite of the 15th century biographers was an amateur writer, as he himself made clear, but one who knew the great men and women of the, of the peninsula. It was a time of great cultural excitement and a time when great commanders like Federigo de Montefeltro emphasized their passion for reading, their passion for the classics. Here you see Federigo, he's forgotten to take off his armor, reading a beautiful folio. And the man who knew most about these men and their collecting passions, the Duvine of the 15th century, was the Florentine bookseller Vespasiano da Bisticci, an impresario of scribes and fine vellum, who saw to it that every patron had the books he wanted. It's, it's, it's Vespasiano who tells us that in the Urbino library, for which he provided 900 stunning manuscripts, all the books are superlatively good and written with the pen, and had there been one printed book, it would have been ashamed in their company. They were beautifully illuminated and written on parchment. He wasn't exaggerating, as you can see from the great Bible and this magnificent copy of the Greek writer Libanius, only two of the treasures now kept in the Vatican Library. Uh, it's true that, as Martin Davis and others have taught us, Federigo did own some printed books, but he kept them in a secondary library, not in the main one with the manuscripts. Marvelously, as Vespasiano supplied books for the new Vatican Library of Nicholas V, for the Library of Oxford University, for the Library of Federigo, he set down his experiences and his contacts in a brisk, informal Italian. He himself had no ambitions for his work. He said, these are just rough commentaries. Someone else can make them into histories. But of course, they're much better than the biographies that have been given a more powerful literary cast, like some of the more rough cut of the biograph, the portrait images you see above us. They're extraordinarily expressive. Just to give one example, it's Vespasiano who tells the story of how that tough nut Alfonso of Aragon found a Sienese ambassador in irritating in his, uh, in his presumption, a man who arrived at court swathed in lace and over elaborate in his manners. So the black wearing Iberian had his lean, grim Spanish courtiers come to him and gave them instructions. And one after another, they pressed against the Sienese ambassador and rubbed against him until by the end of the evening, his costume was completely spoiled and he himself humiliated. It's no wonder that it's Vespasiano's memoirs, more than almost any other text, that filled Jakob Burkhardt's notebooks and that give his book some of its richest material. So biography, like the Renaissance, survived the period covered in this show into a 16th century golden age, and it crashed, like the Renaissance, into a cultural crisis when the armies of the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V sacked Rome in 1527. This event, too, found its proper biographical treatment in a wonderful book by Piero Valeriano on the ill fortune of men of letters, a book that should be read in order to fill them with hope by every dean faced with two big a tenured faculty. It's a book in which tells you how humanists died, transfixing themselves with swords, hurling themselves into wells, starving themselves to death, disappearing, leaping out of windows. There are many ways to kill a humanist, and Valeriano tells you all of them, as well as portraying the characters of the victims with brief, almost tacitean wit. 
But a more fitting place to end is with a life that expresses, perhaps more powerfully than any other, the full contradictions that make personalities in this age so rich. John Francesco Pico della Mirandola's biography of his prodigious polymathic uncle, Pico della Mirandola, the brilliant young prince who sold his birthright as a mercenary soldier for enough money to build the greatest library in Europe, who studied Greek and Hebrew, who could read a Greek poem once and then recite it forwards and then backwards, and who in 1487 invited all the scholars of Europe to a disputation on all the fields of knowledge in Rome, offering to pay their expenses. Pico, who was remembered above all for the oration with which he planned to begin this great debate, beginning, it is written, man is a great miracle, free to make his own fate, the model of Renaissance self-fashioning at its most powerful. John Francesco commemorated that Pico, the young Pico, and insisted that the Pope had been wrong to forget and forbid him to hold his disputations and the Papal Commission wrong to condemn some of the theses that he had planned to debate. But he also insisted that Pico had transformed himself in later life after meeting the Florentine prophet Savonarola, that piety, not learning, had become the center of his aspirations. Pico in later life, so John Francesco reported, burnt a few of his books that were genuinely evil, repented of his worldly ambition for fame, and even enjoyed a vision of the queen of heaven who assured him that he would never wholly die. John Francesco Pico, a hunter of witches, found this last a little worrying and thought when his uncle did die that it might have been a diabolic apparition sent to deceive him. But happily, his uncle then appeared to him surrounded by fire and explained that he was in purgatory, burning away his sins as he should be, and was showing that he had actually found the way of virtue at the end of his life. John Francesco not only wrote Pico's life, he placed it at the start of his collection of Pico's works so that it would provide the necessary cautions with which people would appreciate, would come to this great figure, the phoenix of his age, would keep them from being carried away by Pico's excessive passions for dangerous fields of learning. And this indeed was the message that readers carried away, like that great Augustinian cardinal Egidio da Viterbo, who emulated Pico's study of the Hebrew Kabbalah, but also inhaled the scent of burning straw to give his complexion the air of sanctity, trying to be at once the young and the old Pico simultaneously, an aspiration that also seems to have infected Thomas More, who translated John Francesco's biography into eloquent English. Look carefully at almost any of the images that the Metropolitan has on display. Think about what it was to seek political power or economic gain in a life ruled by a church that promised that such pursuits would be, would be rewarded with damnation, a literal damnation whose flames you could hear beneath the floorboards, whose smoke you could smell. Keep those balanced desires and needs in mind and you will see the portraits in the exhibition gallery in a new and deeper way. Thank you. I think we made the right choice. <laughs> I don't know if you take auditors Tony, for your seminars, but the, I, I'm sure that quite a number would, uh, would love to sign up. Well, our next speaker is someone I've known for a very long time, known and admired and learned from. Professor Caroline Elam is currently Senior Research Fellow at the Warburg Institute at the University of London. She's taught widely, and from 1987 to 2002, she was the editor of the Burlington Magazine. I can attest from personal experience that she saved countless of us from foolish errors and managed always to get more from us than we thought was there. I, that was absolutely a marvel, writing an article, sending it off, and getting Caroline's responses. It always opened new windows, new doors, new ways of looking at things. But most miraculously, all the time that she was paying such meticulous attention to the material that we were submitting, she was conducting her own research on Michelangelo's practice as an architect, 
on the urbanism, on urbanism in Florence and on Lorenzo the Magnificent, and in particular his legendary garden filled with sculpture and artists. Through her work at the Burlington Magazine, she became deeply interested in its most famous editor and founder, Roger Fry, uh, I think probably the, uh, the preeminent British uh, critic of the 20th century, someone who wrote with equal eloquence and insight on Renaissance painting and on Cezanne, whose work he championed. I don't know any topic on Renaissance art on which in chatting with Caroline, I have not left thinking differently than when I began. Lately, she's been fascinated with Leonardo da Vinci's beautiful portrait of Ginevra de Benci in the National Gallery of Art in Washington, and the person for whom it was painted, the Venetian poet Pietro Bembo. It's a subject that relates to so many themes in the second gallery of the exhibition, the one devoted to female portraiture in Florence. Indeed, it's the one truly missed presence in the exhibition. Uh, we knew it, it could not be lent, and we simply breathed a sigh and dealt with it. But we're going to have it in any event in this lecture. Caroline. Thank you so much, Keith, for that wonderful introduction. And I must say, one of my um, most treasured memories of working as editor of the Burlington Magazine was receiving uh, articles from Keith, which absolutely illuminated the pages of the Burlington in my time. Visitors to this stupendous show of Italian portraiture, both in Berlin and here in New York, can't fail to be astonished by the quantity and quality of portrait images in all media from 15th century Florence, dominating the first four rooms of the exhibition. And of course, this is only a fraction of the surviving total. Huge advances have been made in our understanding of these images over the last 30 years or so. Studies of 15th century Florence by art historians, social historians, historians of material culture have investigated the functions, context, and display of portraits in the domestic interior and the part they played in the self-representation of the Florentine merchant elite. But despite a wealth of documentation in the archives, we still know little for certain about why and when portraits were commissioned, who they were for, how they were made, one version of that seen here in this manuscript. And if we adopt a sociologically functionalist view of portraiture, there's a danger of making mistaken assumptions about types and of treating portraits as specimens in an illustrated social history. So, for example, it's often assumed that female portraits were made in the context of betrothal and marriage, and no doubt many were, but there's surprisingly little specific evidence for this practice. Female portraiture in particular has gained but also suffered from approaches such as these. In a now classic article entitled Women in Frames, Patricia Simons argued that it's historically more accurate to think of 15th century Florentine portraits, especially female ones, as gendered items of cultural display, socially conditioned and mediated, rather than as indicators of private subjectiveness or of individual personality. And I think this viewpoint permeated uh, studies of portraiture uh, in um, some studies of portraiture, and for example, was felt now and then in the exhibition, marvelous exhibition, Virtue and Beauty, held at the National Gallery in Washington in 2002, which originally prompted many of the reflections I want to explore today. And Leonardo's Ginevra de Benci, the main focus of my talk today, was there exhibited as an example of the supposed type of marriage portrait. But the notion of private subjectiveness in portraiture is much less anachronistic when viewed in the context of the poetry about portraiture in the period. Patricia Simons herself has written most eloquently about this in a more recent study. And I think that some of the most valuable contributions made to the study of Renaissance portraiture have pursued this line. Elizabeth Cropper's marvelous articles about the influence of the Petrarchan tradition, John Sherman's chapter in his book on Only Connect, and most recently, Lina Bolzoni's illuminating book, Il Cuore di Cristallo, The Heart of Crystal, 
uh, which focuses on the literary side of the relationship between portraiture, especially double portraits and poetry. And some of you may have heard her talking on the subject here a couple of weeks ago. The ancient tradition, the epigrammatic poetic tradition, transmitted through the Greek anthology, which was really rediscovered in the 15th century, engaged with the notion that painting and sculpture could convey only the outer appearance of the person, not their character or mores, while a more optimistic view saw the visual arts through their immediacy and their very similitude as having other possibilities, for example, to arouse desire in the viewer. And I'm showing you here a commemorative portrait, famous one of the late 15th century of Giovanna degli Albizzi by Ghirlandaio, where the inscription in the background refers directly to a famous epigram by Marshall, uh, adapted to say, would that art uh, could uh, represent the character and mind of the sitter. Uh, no portrait would then be more beautiful. Another strand, the animistic tradition of speaking sculptures of works of art coming miraculously to life, also runs through these poems, which were so eagerly emulated in the Renaissance. Central to these questions are Petrarch's famous and incredibly influential poems about his dead beloved Laura in the Canzoniere. I'm showing you here a mid 15th century page in the Bodleian with portraits of Petrarch on the left and Laura on the right. In particular, the two poems which Petrarch wrote about the lost portrait of Laura he commissioned from Simone Martini. Some people don't believe this portrait ever existed. Some people don't think that Laura ever existed. But I do think that uh, Petrarch did commission a portrait of Laura, and that we saw in uh, Tony Grafton's marvelous slide, the frontispiece to his uh, manuscript of Virgil with that incredible image of uh, the Georgics and the Aeneid. In the first of his poems, Petrarch sees Simone's portrait as transcending with divine aid the tra traditional difficulties explored in ancient poetry. Polyclitus, he says, and other famous artists of antiquity would never have been able to encompass Laura's beauty. If Simone's portrait succeeds, it must be because he had painted it in paradise. The second poem reverts to the pessimistic view. In Simone's Laura, in this portrait, voice and intellect are forever lacking. When the poet tries to talk to his portrayed beloved, she appears to listen, but will never reply. It's generally agreed that in his Milanese portraits, recently seen so memorably in the Leonardo exhibition at the National Gallery in London, Leonardo da Vinci set out programmatically to exemplify the belief expressed in his writings on the Paragone, on the comparison between painting and poetry, that painting can more successfully than poetry represent, quote, the very image of the beloved object, or more generally convey the motions of the mind. Most memorably, memorably seen, perhaps, in his uh, miraculous portrait of Cecilia Galladani um, in Krakow. By this stage in his career, Leonardo had the maturity of conception as well as the technical means to make what Sherman's calls the two frames of reference, the poetic and the artistic, conjoin. But the foundations for such an ambition were laid in Florence. And in this talk, I want to focus on examples where 15th century Florentine artists and patrons can be seen to evince conscious aspirations to engage with the expectations aroused in the viewer uh, by knowledge of the poetics of representation. Sometimes this can be explicitly shown through inscriptions or emblematic reference, but even where such evidence is absent, intended meanings can be extrapolated. There are certainly intimations of this later on, uh, earlier on in Florence, as Keith Christensen's pointed out in his marvelous catalog entries on the Castagno portrait in Washington and the double portrait by Filippo Lippi here in the Met. But it was really in Florence in the 1470s that one saw the real flowering of the poetically driven likeness, especially of female, but also, as I'll try to show later, of masculine sitters. 
The 1470s saw the confluence in Florence of various essential cultural strands. First of all, an elite culture steeped in the poetry of the great Trecento poets, and especially in Petrarch's love poems. Secondly, a self-conscious revival of ancient poetry playing with notions of lifelikeness, as we've seen in painting and sculpture. Third, the particular Florentine take on the conventions of idealized courtly love, often but not always of an unattainable married woman, expressed in the verbal and visual rituals of jousts and triumphal processions. This involved the cult of, the, of exceptionally beautiful young women, the focus of Petrarchan adoration, usually without hope or expectation of fulfillment. These were real, live, breathing Florentine girls, but they became objects of idealized desire. Sometimes they died young, and the cult grew up around their memory. Sometimes, even more oddly, they survived as virtuous matrons into old age and into a completely different cultural environment. So we encounter an intriguing and paradoxical intersection of fantasy and actuality. In artistic terms, the means to achieve a greater degree of poetic intimacy and vividness, not necessarily literal likeness, was fed from several new springs, of which one was the availability of examples of Netherlandish portraits by artists such as Petrus Christus and, above all, Hans Memlich. I've just shown, plucked two examples at random here, an extraordinarily large number of the portraits by Memlich that survive are actually of Italian sitters. These portraits were their sitters turned towards the viewer rather than in profile, and their mastery of the oil medium. Netherlandish illusionism, indeed, had long been admired by Italian humanist writers. Another important strand was the flexible and non-restrictive Florentine workshop structure, where artists could simultaneously practice sculpture, painting, and goldsmithery, where painters were used to the third dimension by working from models, and sculptor goldsmiths were masters of design. One can argue that it was in stony marble that Florentine artists first attempted to convey vivid effects of fleeting emotion and sensibility. Such paradoxical effects were, as we've seen, the stuff of lyric poems about sculpture in the Greek anthology. The key artist here, surely, was Desiderio da Settignano, whose miraculously living and breathing female portrait bust from Berlin is in the exhibition upstairs. Note the slight provocative tilt of her head, the almost quivering of her upper lip, the tender fleshiness around her eyes. Nothing is certain about this bust. Even the attribution has been queried. But I would like to agree with Francesco Cagliotti, his, his restatement of the traditional view, that this could indeed be the portrait of Marietta Strozzi by Desiderio, which is mentioned several times in the 16th century sources. Marietta was a famous teenage beauty and heiress, granddaughter of the great humanist patrician Paola Strozzi, who had been exiled in 1434 by the Medici regime. She was brought up in Florence by her mother, Alessandra de Bardi, and attracted many suitors. In 1464, she was the dedicatee of a sumptuous spectacle with a procession of knights, pages, and musicians to the Bardi Palace, during which she looked down from a balcony at a Petrarchan triumphal float with cupids armed with bows. In fact, political crises meant that she didn't find a husband in Florence, but was married in 1471 to a wealthy courtier and soldier at the Este court in Ferrara, Teofilo Calcagnini. And uh, we see in the exhibition the way these currents flow out from Florence to uh, northern centers. Although it would be very nice to be certain about this connection between the bust and the sitter, it doesn't really matter for our purposes whether the, whether the Berlin bust is truly of Marietta or not. The poetic qualities essayed in it are surely not in doubt. Beautiful young Florentine women were even more likely to be eulogized in verse if they died untimely deaths, as was the case with Albiera degli Albizzi, betrothed to Sigismondo della Stufa, who died at the age of 15 in 1473. Her fiancé commissioned a posthumous bust of her, and she and her portrait, which hasn't yet been identified, were commemorated in an anthology of neo-Latin poems. 
The title of one of these by Alessandro Braccesi, Ad Bustum Marmorium, is fascinatingly one of the very earliest examples of the term bust to designate this type of representation of a head on a neck and part of the chest. It means something completely different in classical Latin. Alessandro Braccesi's poem, clearly inspired by ancient poetry, invites the passerby to pause and ask himself whether the great Greek sculptors Polycletus or Praxiteles had ever extracted such images from marble. In another of the poems, the marble bust itself speaks to the viewer. And Alison Lux at the National Gallery in Washington has explored uh, these poems and uh, is working on possible identity uh, of the uh, sculptor. As you can see in this show, painted portraits of Florentine women before the 1470s were always in profile. And this has been analyzed in terms of social decorum and the depiction of virtue that women were discouraged from in engaging the male gaze. I'm showing you on the left uh, the wonderful prof profile portrait by Baldovinetti in the National Gallery in London. And on the right, a trio of busts I photographed during the Desiderio exhibition in Washington to show how similar the profiles are uh, if you take the busts uh, from the side. The profile was, of course, associated with medallic commemoration, and this is abundantly um, seen upstairs. And it also enabled a full appreciation of the aesthetic of the sinuous line and throat we find in uh, assessment of potential brides at this period that the gola is frequently uh, a subject of comment. But in the 1470s, I'm showing you here, of course, the two great Polaiolo um, profile portraits, which the one on the right in Milan is not, unfortunately, uh, in this showing of the exhibition. But in the 1470s, encouraged by sculpture, by Netherlandish painting, and by a quest for intimate interaction between sitter and viewer, female sitters begin to turn towards us. And here, a trio of extraordinary representations from the middle of the decade one of them a sculpture, challenge and transform the seemingly settled norms of female portraiture. Botticelli's early portrait, the so-called Smeralda Brandini, uh, has been left, lent to the show from the Victoria and Albert Museum. This is an exceedingly unusual image. I'll call her Smeralda for convenience sake, although the inscription which identifies her as such is a piece of fake genealogy from considerably later on. The lady is distinctively posed and dressed. She wears a red underdress with the sleeves visible at her wrists, and over it a fine transparent overgarment with a gold embroidered border. The fine stuff is delicately gathered in and sewn to the gold-edged neckline. The sleeves are ample and flowing. This seems to be a garment known as a guarnello, similar to one worn 30 years later by Leonardo's Mona Lisa, as we can now see much more clearly in the recently cleaned Prado copy. You can see this transparent overgarment, uh, and in the Madrid version, the red sleeves visible under the gauzy material. We can assume that this is a dress worn only inside the house, but it looks very rich, and this must surely be a lady of high status. She looks at us from a window. She's opened a wooden shutter, visible on the right, and she stands between it and the window opening, holding the frame with her right hand. The perspective of the room's architecture is implausibly steep, used to create strong compositional lines. For example, this line here, which echoes the line of her arm. On the left is another opening divided by a central column. But there's little point in trying to work out the room in detail. This is an architecture constructed to box in the figure and to evoke rather than to imitate a specific palazzo interior. It reminds us that the 15th century woman's place is in the home, but this woman doesn't appear confined or hemmed in. Indeed, she gazes steadily out at us. How then are we to interpret this lady's stance and her calm outward gaze 
so different from the virtuous profiles of most Florentine female sitters up to this date. Some have seen this domestically. Sitter and viewer are constructed as friends. Patricia Rubin wrote in her wonderful catalogue, uh, with, written with Alison Wright, Florence in the 1470s. The viewer, quote, an intimate visitor to the household who is received into a private and well-ordered realm by the dutiful manager of the household. Stefan Weppelmann, in his entry for this catalogue, is tempted by the idea of a memorial to a deceased woman, lifelikeness here making absence manifest, giving added poignancy to the fiction of real presence. But I don't think she's dead. Contrast her with Glenandaio's celebrated image of the deceased Giovanna degli Albizzi, seen in medallic profile and frozen uh, to the spot. Here instead, the sitter seems um, <clears throat> to be engaging with us. My question is whether the intimate relationship set up between the subject and the viewer implies a poetic reference. Fascinatingly, the painting was owned in the 19th century by the English painter poet, Italian-born Dante Gabriel Rossetti. As Mark Evans at the V&A has pointed out to me, Rossetti himself, who translated the Italian poets, was clearly reminded by the picture of a passage in Dante's Vita Nuova, where, filled with terrible sorrow after Beatrice's death, Dante sees a kind lady, a gentile donna, at a window, looking at him with eyes full of compassion, so that the very sum of pity seemed in her to be gathered together. And this is quoted on the label upstairs. The poet is tempted to fall in love with her, but a vision of Beatrice makes him repent of his new desire. Rossetti depicted his lover, Janie Morris, as the Donna Nella Finestra in a painting now at the fog. Her loose garment and the lodger-like setting are clearly derived from the Botticelli portrait. Botticelli became, of course, in later life, the illustrator of Dante's Divine Comedy, and it would be very nice to think that a reference to the Vita Nuova was intended here. I'm not sure we can go this far, but it does seem to me that this, if somewhat embryonically, is a poetic portrait, certainly very far removed from the familiar notion of the Florentine lady as trophy bride. And it wouldn't be far-fetched to suppose that an educated Florentine viewer might be reminded of Dante's lines when he looked at it. I say somewhat embryonically because I feel that the painting, although brave and in some ways revolutionary, is not a complete success. It seems not to have had much influence, although Botticelli himself used the architectural ideas in his commemorative portrait of Giuliano de' Medici. And of course, the frank gaze does appear now very often in works by later artists. Botticelli himself arrives at more successful strategies, especially for male portraits, which we'll look at in a, in a minute. While, to my mind, one of his very finest female portrait images this wonderfully sober lady in the Palazzo Pitti reverts to the traditional profile, but with such a perfect sense of placement and interval, looking forward, I always think, to the great portraits of horses by the 18th century English artist George Stubbs. <laughs> Just as innovative as Smeralda and more successful as a work of art is Verrocchio's portrait bust of a lady with a posy of flowers in the Bargello in Florence. When this was shown in Washington alongside the bust in this exhibition from the Frick, I'm afraid I was immediately convinced that the Frick lady couldn't be by Verrocchio. And I'm sorry if I'm offending sensibilities here. The Frick bust is delightful. It has taken up some of the alertness and liveliness of Desiderio's Marietta, but it completely lacks the gravitas, the powerful poetry, as well as the brilliance of the marble working of the lady with the flowers. And yet, to my mind, they must be of very much the same date because of the hairstyle of the bust in the frick, so that I don't think it can be of the 1460s, as has been claimed. Of course, what's so exciting and novel here in Verrocchio's bust is the inclusion of the hands, itself an extraordinary technical tour de force not to be repeated, uh, in this period. 
using the hands to convey a degree of expressivity which is almost denied to the face itself, which remains somewhat impassive. The bust has been beautifully analyzed by Andrew Butterfield in his book on Verrocchio, and I agree with him that this must be a portrayal of the patron's beloved lady. Alas, we have no idea who that patron or that lady was, whether newlywed wife or unattainable mistress. What we need to get right, first of all, I think, is her dress. The first layer is straightforward enough. She wears something called a covecere, the skimpy, completely transparent little garment, almost like a scarf fastened with a pin. One can see it also clearly at the back of the sculpture. It's often said that over that she wears a guarnello, the kind of transparent overgarment we've seen in Botticelli's Smeralda, but this is definitely not the case. Verrocchio's lady is shown in a very particular state of undress, which enhances her mysterious ambiguity. She's wearing the fine lawn shift, or camicia, which is the universal Italian Renaissance undergarment. If you compare it with Botticelli's Smeralda, you can see that Verrocchio's shift is just about as basic as it can be. No borders, just a simply gathered neckline, and the sleeves made seamlessly of the same piece of material. <clears throat> he has a surviving late 16th century camicia, uh, and above it, a, mo a modern uh, reconstruction. You can find examples of these now wonderfully on the internet because there are millions of people uh, f uh, constructing Renaissance garments uh, busily and posting their results on the net. Verrocchio's lady is naked under her shift, and as Jeanette Cole has recently pointed out, her middle finger even seems to point directly to her nipple. Clearly, this is not the kind of outfit a respectable Florentine would wear to stand at a window and be seen like Botticelli's lady. The nosegay of flowers she holds gently between her breasts is swathed in one end of the white sa is, is swathed in one end of the wide sash she wears around her waist. I believe the flowers to be wild roses, which have particularly sharp briars. So she's protecting herself, as Eleonora Luciano nicely suggested, from the thorns of the rose. And all this, of course, suggests the imagery of love. So what exactly is going on? If this were an image from 16th century Venice you might assume that you were looking at a mistress or a courtesan. But in 15th century Florence, such images are completely unknown, and the lady's stony gaze forbids the interpretation. We can only conclude that this is a tribute from a husband to his wife, and that the imagery points to married love and fecundity. <clears throat> I've said that the combination of sculpture and painting in Verrocchio's workshop was vital for the emergence of the poetics of portraiture. Alas, no painted portrait by Verrocchio actually survives, but we know that he made one, and its loss is especially tantalizing because it must have been central to our subject. In the famous list of works Verrocchio executed for the Medici family is itemized, quote, a wooden panel with the representation of the head of Lucrezia Donati. Now, Lucrezia, was the youthful Lorenzo de' Medici's innamorata, the wife of, a uh, young wife of Niccolo Ardinghelli. And the picture was perhaps made around 1469, the year of Lorenzo's joust, of which Lucrezia was the dedicatee. Thanks to a new document, we now know that during the dispersal of the property in 1495, after the Medici expulsion, it was sold to Lucrezia's son for 23 florins, described as a figure or image or picture of his mother. And I've rather obsessively listed this, this evidence on the left for want of having the sculpture itself. There's the um, deliberation of the Medici trustees. The painting inspired one of Lorenzo de' Medici's Petrarchan sonnets in which he initially invokes the portrait of his con as his constant source of comfort and strength until he realizes that words addressed to a painted image are in vain. 
What a terrible loss this painting is. We desperately want to know how Verrocchio went about the depiction in paint of a beautiful but inaccessible innamorata for the benefit of her platonic lover. Only the Bargello bust can give us any clue. It would be very nice to think that the portrait was in three-quarter view rather than a traditional profile, making its muteness for Lorenzo still more poignant. As the painting was acquired by Lucrezia's son as a picture of her mother, his mother, sorry, we may assume that it was a recognizable image of an actual person rather than a fancy portrait, such as Botticelli's two profiles in the show <clears throat> from Frankfurt and Ber Berlin. These have been romantically associated uh, since the 19th century with another married innamorata of the Medici and dedicatee of a just, Simonetta Vespucci, who died suddenly in 1476. And I must emphasize that there's absolutely no evidence that these are idealized portraits of Simonetta. To me, they don't look as though they're even intending to be of the same person. And while we're at it, many of you must have been struck, as I was in the show, by how much more brilliant the Berlin portrait on the right is than the Frankfurt one on the left, even though that's such an interesting image and so huge in comparison to most 15th century portraits. And I think that the date of these is much later uh, than is said on their labels. Fascinatingly, though, we know that Simonetta was portrayed in her lifetime, but certainly not in this idealized guise. We know from an extraordinary letter written by her father-in-law, Piero Vespucci, that the distraught Giuliano de' Medici, her platonic lover, after her death, was actually given her clothes as well as a portrait of her, showing that the relationship between these platonic lovers and the in, their in-laws and their relations by mar and the, the, with the in-laws of, the, of their innamorate uh, was a completely um, accepted one and that there was no social discomfort about uh, such relationship. The Botticelli profiles certainly are poetic images, there's no doubt about that, but of a quite different sort, and I haven't got time to do them justice here. Instead, I want to focus on the third of my revolutionary female portrait images of the 1470s, Leonardo's Ginevra de Benci in Washington, painted at a time when Leonardo was still a member of Verrocchio's workshop. As we shall see, it's an intriguingly hybrid work with important elements derived from outside Florence. The identification of this melancholy, moon-faced beauty as the Ginevra di Amerigo de Benci, whom the young Leonardo is known from his early biographers to have portrayed, was established from style and iconography at the beginning of the last century by the great German art historian Wilhelm von Bode. Her name, of course, is reflected in the dark juniper thicket against which she shines out. Jennifer Fletcher showed brilliantly over 20 years ago that the reverse of the panel incorporates the device of the laurel and palm personal to the Venetian humanist and diplomat Bernardo Bembo, found on the manuscripts he owned, such as this one in Cambridge, uh, and the works of art, other works of art he commissioned, like the tomb of Dante in Ravenna. Since then, since Jennifer's article, further evidence has come to light, making the Bembo Commission uh, even more certain, or the connection even more certain. As has long been known, the platonic but intense devotion avowed by Bembo to the young and chaste wife of Luigi di Bernardo Nicolini during his two embassies to Florence in 1475 to 6 and in 1478 to 80 was celebrated in another series of neo-Latin poems, like the one we saw earlier on to Albiero degli Albizzi, written by Cristoforo Landino, Alessandro Braccesi, and Naldo Naldi. The poems don't specifically name, um, mention the portrait, but one of them by Landino talks of Ginevra in very similar terms to the portrait's inscription. And the way that the picture is referred to in Leonardo's biographies suggests that it was discussed at the time in terms of the rhetorics of 
verisimilitude. For example, one of the uh, manuscript biographies says, Leonardo portrayed in Florence from the life Ginevra de, Me de Amerigo Benci, the which seemed so, a uh, which was so well finished that it seemed not a portrait, but rather the real Ginevra, la propria Ginevra. Despite excellent studies of the painting, a number of central questions remain. Who commissioned the portrait? When was it painted? Why is the reverse apparently painted in a different medium from the front? Why was the motto on the reverse, as we shall see, changed? Given the Bembo connection, why and how did the portrait remain in Florence after he went back to Venice? A number of different proposals have so far been put forward, some of them very complicated indeed, but I shall put to you a very simple story to cover the phenomena. Whether or not it is right, it in no way exhausts the interest of this work in terms of looking for meaning and indeed for beauty. Leonardo's painting certainly had an afterlife in Florence. There's a portrait derived from it by Lorenzo di Credi here at the Met and on view in the show upstairs. <clears throat> Most confusingly, this has an inscription on the back identifying it as Ginevra di Amerigo dei Benci. I'm very grateful for this uh, image of the back. The inscription is up there, but this doesn't convince me as being an early inscription. X-rays of the painting, which you can see in the catalogue, I think, show that the face and clothing were initially closer, closer to the Washington picture. Everett Fay has in concluded in his catalogue entry that this does indeed portray Ginevra de Benci at a date shortly after the Washington portrait. But I really don't think that this can be the case. The two sitters don't look at all alike. And although uh, Lorenzo di Credi's sitter must be a woman called Ginevra, she's surely not the same person as the one in Leonardo's portrait. And the style of the dress and perhaps especially of the jewel, to me, indicate a later date, this rather elaborately uh, framed jewel hanging uh, from her, uh, around her neck, looks more like later jewels, like the ones designed by Holbein in his uh, book of designs in the British Museum, than anything you find in a 15th century portrait, like this detail from the Ghirlandaio Ginevra uh, Giovanna degli Albizzi. I suspect that the inscription on the back may actually be a fraudulent attempt to identify the work with Leonardo's painting as recorded in the sources before the original was actually identified, which, as we've seen, was not uh, all that long ago, only 100 years ago. The Washington picture is clearly cut down at the bottom and the Crady portrait, as well as Verrocchio's bust of a woman holding flowers, raises the question, which I think is still open, of whether or not the Ginevra originally included the sitter's hands. It has been reconstructed to show this um, by the National Gallery, incorporating hands from Leonardo's wonderful drawing at Windsor, which we'll look at in just a second. But to my mind, this gives a rather over tall and thin a result Where's it gone? Lost the back. It'll come up in a minute. Um, with a rather unlikely gap at the bottom of the reverse. Yes, there we are. Sorry. You can see that the, to reconstruct it like this, there's this funny, funny gap at the bottom. And the whole thing looks as though it ought to end more, more like this uh, than lower down. In any case, some scholars now think that the Leonardo drawing should be late, dated much later to Leonardo's Milanese period. And it's quite possible there may never have been hands in the Washington portrait, and that the hands in Lorenzo di Credi derive instead uh, from the Verrocchio. But I'm not uh, insisting on this at all. It's often been assumed that Leonardo's portrait is a betrothal or a marriage portrait, but Ginevra, who was married in 1474, isn't shown as a bride in rich clothes and jewels, but rather as a virtuous housewife, the most beautiful of matrons, as Bembo later described her 
in a touching man marginalium to one of his manuscripts, wearing a de demurely simple brown dress laced with blue over a transparent veil-like covetiere uh, fastened with a pin. It's just like that garment that we saw on the Verrocchio bust. Only one ele element of the dress remains to be explained, and that's the black stole over her shoulders. Ginevra is shown in more than three-quarters view, her pallor and her almond eyes close to a portrait by Petrus Christus, which was probably in the Medici collection. Bembo himself surely possessed, although he didn't commission, a diptych by Memlink, uh, later owned by his son Pietro and listed in his collection. Um, I've put it together. It's in two different collections now. Indeed, Bembo had himself portrayed, um, it's been suggested that Bembo had himself portrayed by Memlink during his time as a diplomat in Bruges in the early 1470s, and that he might be the pensive young man holding a coin of Nero lent from the museum in Antwerp to the show upstairs, where a sprig, possibly of bay laurel, appears at the bottom, and a palm tree in the middle distance, so the two elements of um, Bembo's emblem. This is a tempting idea, not least because the mood of the Memling seems so similar to Leonardo's Ginevra. But the sitter of the Antwerp portrait is surely younger than 40, as Bembo would then have been, and it may be that he's simply uh, a young Italian called Neri. Ginevra's placement within a landscape is certainly close to the format of Memling's portraits of male Italian sitters, but Leonardo has given movement to her pose by placing her on the diagonal and has avoided the kind of high-toned plein air effect we know he disliked from his own writings by screening her off with the prickly juniper that stresses her indomitable virtue. Though she seems to turn her face slowly round towards us, she scarcely engages our gaze. Her eyes are veiled, giving off only the faintest reflections of light. Leonardo's command of technique and foreshortening is still imperfect. The oil paint is crinkled in the background, and the right-hand side of Ginevra's face is alarmingly wide, her nose surprisingly straight. But nonetheless, this is an extraordinary achievement for an artist in his 20s, rightly described by David Allen Brown as the most complex portrait thus far attempted in Florence, and I'm very grateful to David, who's in the audience this afternoon, for his tolerance of my heterodox views about the Ginevra. The landscape is by no means a pastiche of Memling, as we saw, for example, in the Lorenzo di Credi and in other Florentine paintings of the period, but rather a, new, a quite new and successful attempt at shimmering atmospheric effects. The emblematic reverse seems to be painted in tempera, not in oil, as would appear from the minute hatched lines of the modeling, which you can see on this side. And the National Gallery at the moment are undertaking um, tests to see whether it in is indeed uh, in temper as it seems to be. On the reverse, branches of laurel and palm encircle a juniper sprig against a background of simulated porphyry. The scroll is inscribed in beautiful humanistic capital letters, Virtutem Forma Decorat, which we can provisionally translate as form adorns virtue. However, infrared reflectography has shown that the reverse was painted in two stages. In the first, Ginevra's sprig uh, was already encircled by Bembo's branches of laurel and palm and connected to them by the inscribed scroll. But the motto on the scroll was a different one, so one can see most clearly in this enhanced image, corresponding exactly to Bembo's own, Virtus et Honor. At a second moment, the motto was changed to Virtutem Forma Decorat, expressing an entirely different concept. According to my simple storyline, Bembo would have commissioned the portrait during his first embassy in Florence in 1475 to 6, he was very lucky to obtain that rare thing, a finished portrait by Leonardo, who must have been anxious to prove himself as an independent artist while emerging from Verrocchio's studio. But we must remember that Leonardo was also a friend 
of Ginevra's brother, Giovanni Benci, and this may be relevant uh, to the whole story. Perhaps Bembo took the painting back to him, back to Venice with him when he left in 1476, and there commissioned a gifted local painter to perfect its identity as a personal and precious object. And here I'm venturing on treacherous ground. The reverse was painted with devices which, um, as we've seen, the reverse was painted with devices referring to Ginevra's name, the juniper sprig. Her and Bembo's enduring strength of character, the porphyry background, as well as his moral qualities and his ownership of the picture, the motto, Virtus et Honor. Illusion was also made to his restraint as a lover. The virtuous and honorable Bembo is seen to embrace chastely, without touching, the impeccable beloved who is encircled but left free by his scrolling presence. The emblematic reverse is yet another example of the influence of northern painting on Bembo's patronage. Netherlandish portraits often have painted reverses with mottos, an interesting early example being this one here in the Courtauld Institute by a pupil of Campin, with its branch of holly and its motto, I hate the thing that bites. John Sherman was the first to suggest that the exquisite reverse of the Ginevra might have been painted not by Leonardo, but by Giacometto Veneziano, who later painted several similar portrait reverses with humanistic references. For example, here in the exhibition, uh, the emblematic chain deer with the Greek inscription for always, ai, ai against the porphyry background. And perhaps closest to the Ginevra, the portrait of a man in the National Gallery in London with the crossed laurel branches and an inscription from Horace on the reverse. We know that in the Bembo house in Padua, there were portraits by Giacometto of Bernardo's sons, and the one of Carlo as a tiny baby, who was born in 1472, uh, must have come from earlier in the decade than the Leonardo portrait. All this might suggest a non-Florentine context for the reverse, and certainly it's in Venice uh, that we find this type developed. But I have to say um, that David Brown is still convinced that the reverse is by Leonardo, and he knows a great deal more about Leonardo than I do. But it's worth asking ourselves whether it's possible that either Giacometto or perhaps a very gifted um, Paduan manuscript illuminator might have been responsible for this reverse. Seems very odd that it's done in tempera, unless this is simply a change of technique uh, to mirror the change of subject. Instructed by the Venetian government to undertake another embassy to Florence in 1478, Bernardo could have decided to take the portrait back with him and give it to Ginevra. Such a transfer of ownership would require a change of motto. The picture was no longer to belong to Bembo, and it would be indecorous for it to carry wording specific to his personal identity. The new inscription, Virtutem Forma Decorat, carries much richer connotations than the old. It's no longer an assertion of ownership, but rather a philosophical statement. It encourages the viewer to meditate on the metaphysical and pictorial relationship between outer and inner beauty and virtue. Decorat is usually translated as adorns or decorates, but it can also carry the more elevated notion of honors and distinguishes, related to words like decorum. The inscription closely ma matches the sentiments of Landino's poems about Bembo's love for Ginevra. And an added enrichment brought about by the reworking of the motto is the way that the word forma now encircles Ginevra's alter ego, the juniper sprig. There's a wonderful touch, this, first three letters and then the last two encircling the juniper. Bembo's presence in words has now been effaced. He remains only vestigially in the laurel and palm, which in fact are just as appropriate to Ginevra him herself. She too was a poet. It's also interesting to note that the second motto is painted in more refined lettering than the slightly clumsy capitals 
of the first inscription. Of course, it may be the case that Bembo had this change of mind, this decision to give the painting to Ginevra, which he must surely have done at an earlier stage than I'm suggesting, but the sequence and motivation for the change would be the same. In Leonardo's Ginevra, it's the exceptional sensitivity and subtlety of the painting, as much as the inscriptions on the reverse, that mark this out <clears throat> as a work intended to challenge the claims of poetry. As Elizabeth Cropper has finally observed in this work, quote, the poet's denial of the validity of painted appearances is refuted through painting itself. I'm sure she is right to situate the picture in the context of the Petrarchan tradition. The punning deployment of the juniper bush echoes Petrarch's constant equation of his Laura with the noble bay tree. This was the accepted poetic currency, both in the Florence of Lorenzo de' Medici, himself a Laura, of course, and in Bembo's Venice. Bernardo's son Pietro was to oversee the published edition of Petrarch's sonnets. Thus, we can surely agree that all Renaissance portraits of beautiful women, including Ginevra, operate, as Elizabeth Cropper has said, to a greater or lesser degree in a Petrarchan context and assume knowledge of it on the cultivated viewer's part. I wanted to add in a brief comment on a picture in Berlin, which was shown in the Berlin version of the portraits exhibition, but isn't present here at the Met. A young woman by the artist we used to call the master of Santo Spirito, who's now identified as Agnolo di Domenico di Donino del Mazziere. My poor reproduction of it here must be before cleaning. It turned out to be one of the Berlin show's surprising stars. It's a much more refined image than it appears to be at first sight. For example, there's rather beautiful uh, gilding in the hair. Clearly, it's inspired uh, by Leonardo's Ginevra, even in the uh, choice of <clears throat> costume. The subject looks, looks dead straight out at the viewer, but her gaze is frank rather than provocative. <coughs> What's fascinating here, apart from the quality, is that the panel is covered front and back with inscriptions. It's kind of overdetermined as a poetic image, leaving the observer no choice but to engage with the text it displays. These are not just the Noli Me Tangeri on the par parapet, but quotes from Petrarch's Triumph of Chastity on the reverse and from a Florentine herald portrait and, uh, and also a proverbial um, comment. Uh, it was as God wanted, it shall be um, as, he, as he wants. Is this a betrothal portrait or is this an image of a beloved matron? She is simply dressed, but has a rich necklace. Whatever the case, she is indubitably Petrarchan. Noli me tangeri is not just a risque citation from St. John's Gospel, but it relates to Petrarch's poem, Una candida cerva, which describes a stag wearing a collar inscribed, let no one touch me. There's a further ambiguity, perhaps an injunction not to touch the painting itself. But of course, you have to touch it and pick it up and turn it round in order to get the complete series of messages it relates. Finally, it should be remembered that Florentine poetic portraiture is not confined to the depiction of female sitters, as we can see above all in the work of Filippino Lippi and Botticelli. And I should add in here uh, the very interesting Botticelli portrait upstairs of the um, poet and uh, condottiere uh, Marullo. It has to be said also, however, that relationship with poetry doesn't necessarily produce a suggestively poetical result. This double portrait in the Art Museum in Denver must surely be, as has been suggested by Jill Burke and Patrizia Zambrano, the image of Filippino Lippi and his patron, Piero del Pugliese, about which we know uh, several neo-Latin poems, including two uh, by Alessandro Braccesi. The poems are entirely conventional, <clears throat> not to say banal in content. Piero Pugliese is scarcely so similar to himself as the painted panel is similar to Piero, 
whom the noble sleepers expressed with marvellous art, so that you would be able to say that it was the work of Apelles, and at the same time, he has painted himself in the same panel, so that he differs not at all from the painted image. I often find that Braccesi's tropes are rather uh, banal. And it has to be said that even the picture, with its odd composition and awkward changes of scale, is much less fascinating as a work of art than it is as a social and cultural phenomenon. And it's not helped by a very fuzzy slide here, which was all I could get. Nonetheless, it's not just a painting calculated for poetic perception, but an extraordinarily interesting testimony, evidently, of friendship between the artist and his patron. Much more evocative is the beautiful, if damaged, portrait by Filippino Lippi in the National Gallery in Dublin of a musician stringing his lira da braccio and gazing back in a melancholy fashion at the viewer. The portrait's inscribed at bottom left with a line of poetry, El cominciar non fia per tempo o mai, beginning now may not be soon enough. Jonathan Nelson was able to identify this as a quotation from the long poem, Io vo pensando, which opens the second part of Petrarch's Canzoniere. It's a very remarkable introspective piece in which the poet expresses competing desires for spiritual immortality, literary fame, and erotic fulfillment. His love for Laura continually paralyzing his resolve and pulling him back. Three inner voices argue with him, the line here being from the first, who urges him to erase the image of Lara from his heart and to spring into more worthy action, for delay is dangerous and beginning now may not be soon enough. So although the Petrarchan line has almost certainly been chosen for its punning reference to musical time or tempo, it signals too that this picture is in some sense the male equivalent of the female portraits of ideally beautiful beloveds which evoke the image of Laura. Here instead, a melancholy youth listens to his Petrarchan inner voices and seems visibly tormented by conflicting desires. The inscription here functions as a kind of emblematic prompt to interpretation, but we, we may imagine that discussion of the picture's meaning um, among friends, for example, might have been as open-ended as Petrarch's poem. We don't know who the sitter is, but we may be sure that the iconography was worked out with Filippino's active collaboration. We know that he had a copy of the Canzoniere, along with the vernacular works of Dante and Boccaccio, listed in his post-mortem inventory. Given the explicit poetic reference in the Filippino portrait, it's hard not to feel that the images of young men by Botticelli, which so directly address the viewer, the one in the National Gallery on the left, and especially the astounding example in the National Gallery in Washington on the right, presuppose similar expectations and responses. But here and in other cases, for the moment, we simply don't have the clues necessary to work out exactly what that poetic meaning is intended to be. <clears throat> other pertinent examples, I would suggest, by Botticelli, or the young man with the medal of Cosimo de' Medici in the Uffizi on the left. Is this a member of the Medici family or a goldsmith or simply a Medici loyalist? Whatever the case, the use of an actual stucco cast of the posthumous medal of Cosimo pressed to the sitter's heart creates intriguing contrasts between sculptural relief and painting, a kind of paragone, while giving the illusion that the actual medal just contained by the sitter's hands, is much larger than it is in reality. You can see upstairs that you could easily uh, pick it up in one hand. Even more fascinating and perplexing is the portrait on the right of a young man holding a roundel with the head of a saint cut out from a Trecento Sienese picture. Some people have claimed that the 14th century painting was inserted at a much later date, but I don't agree that this needs to be the case. And it's fascinating, I noticed this only when I saw the picture every day uh, when working in Washington, that the medium of the portrait is in tempera with greenish terra verde underpainting, a technique which is not normally employed by Botticelli, and yet I feel convinced that Botticelli did indeed paint the portrait. 
seems to me that he may have adopted it here in order to fit in with the material factor of the inserted fragment whose history and meaning uh, remain to be deciphered. I began this lecture with a homily about the danger of making assumptions that 15th century portraits may be classified into readily recognizable functional types. You may feel by now that I've fallen into this trap myself with my over-reliance on the word poetic to characterize such a number and range of different examples. Such, certainly, such richly contingent images reward consideration as individual works of art, each with its own genesis and context. But such evidence as we have, inscribed on the works themselves and recorded in the literature of their reception, strongly suggests that the cultural context of poetic imagery was a central aspect of these portraits' intended meaning. And in the very rare cases, such as the Ginevra de Benci, where we can piece together an almost complete array of different types of evidence, the argument for the poetics of painting becomes compelling. Thank you very much. Well, I just want to thank our two speakers for a truly exceptional afternoon. And uh, of course, it, it, after, after hearing uh, two talks like this, it makes me wish that we were back again reorganizing the exhibition, making different choices, uh, emphasizing different things.